I woke up, saw some good weather, started feeling better, I've been sick. Thought I'd make a video about how to get started in paramotors. Join me. All right. Here we are, set up in the front yard. I'm gonna try and run into the sky like I have some kind of superpower. Because that is the dream. So, I'm sitting here at 3,000 feet above the clouds or fog layer. Thought I'd talk about what you might want to know if you're getting started in paramotors. Uh, some of the common questions, how much does it cost? How do I get started? Um, what motor should I buy? Super common question. And then some other things I think you might need to know. But to start off with, how much does it cost? Uh, so training runs between, I'll say like 1500, 2000, and 3500 on kind of the high end. That's about right. Uh, the motor itself, new, costs somewhere around seven to 8500, like that's about right, 7000 to 9000. So we're already at 10 grand, you know, at least. And uh, the wing costs three to 4000, new, right? If you buy used, you can cut those prices in half. I wouldn't want to cut them more than half. You know, I wouldn't want to buy a wing for less than 1500. I wouldn't want to buy a motor for less than four grand. Uh, I would rather see you in more reliable stuff. Uh, the oldest stuff, you know, it's aviation. Let, let, let's, let's keep in mind that safety is an important factor. Training, where to go training. So the, the two schools that I'm closest with are Team Fly Halo and Aviator PPG. Uh, Aviator PPG moves a lot more students and they also have this thing called an alliance program. And uh, basically what happened is Aviator PPG's waiting list got backed up by like two years, maybe even more. So what they did is they partnered with other schools, they brought their instructors in, and you know, I want to say they taught them the Aviator PPG way, but I've been there and the reality is that uh, while that's true, you know, they also learn things from the visiting instructors and it's just been like a collaborative effort that made everyone in the network better, you know? It, just because I'm going to learn the Aviator PPG way doesn't mean that I don't have anything that I couldn't teach Aviator PPG. Well, maybe I don't, but you know, the visiting instructors. So those are good ways to get started. Which motor should I buy? I, a little bit about that question first. Everybody starts in their interest in this sport, wondering what gear they should buy. And I was no different. Uh, the thing it is, it is the wrong question. That, that's not the question that you're supposed to be asking. When you start skydiving, people don't usually ask, which parachute should I buy? They ask, where should I learn? When you start flying a plane, they usually think like, ah, oh, how can I get lessons? How can I try this out? Um, they don't think to themselves, you know, should I get a Cessna 152 or 172? I really like this. Um, yeah, usually it starts off with how do I learn how to do this? But in paramotors, for whatever reason, it usually starts off with which motor do I buy? So your instructor will probably have some advice for you. Your instructor might sell a motor. So that kind of thing can sometimes cloud an instructor's judgment on which motor they put you on. Typically they like the motors they sell and that's a big part of their motivation, but gosh, you know, we can't ignore finance, uh, the financial incentives, right? Um, which motor fits you best it has a lot to do with your weight and your strength. So uh, if you're a really small guy or a, a kind of normal sized woman, then the top 80 is a super reliable motor. And this is the engine. There's a lot of different paramotors built around this engine, but to focus on the engine itself, the top 80 is a good choice up and through, I would say about 150 pounds, you know? If you hit 150 pounds, then I think that stops being the right motor for you. Uh, the Nitro 200, man. So, you know, full disclosure, I've got a Nitro 200 with about 250 hours on it. I have loved that motor. Uh, it was super reliable for me through about 175 hours, which is pretty good. 
and uh, since then I've been leaning on the warranty support a little bit but that has been outstanding and, until they eventually replace the whole motor which it, the, the support on it has been great that's just what I'm trying to get out there and the reliability on it has been great too uh, 175 hours without a hiccup 174 really is really good the Nitro is a light motor. Uh, it's not quite as powerful as like the Moster 185 Plus, but it's lightweight, helps new people learn a ton. Uh, it was my second motor. I got it when I had 15 hours of experience, and suddenly I became better at launching and landing, like, like it was a magic trick, you know? Suddenly I'm good at this. And uh, the big difference is I had a heavy motor. My, my first motor, I, I have to say it out loud, my first motor was a Fresh Breeze, and it was super duper heavy. With, with fuel in it, it was like 85 pounds, whereas a Nitro with fuel and everything is about 55. It's about 42, 45 empty. And it just made such a difference to cut all that weight, and, uh, and, and there it was. So the Nitro is a good choice for people as light as like, I don't know, 115, 125 pounds. You know, you can go all the way light on a Nitro. And I think you get too heavy for a Nitro, somewhere around 230 pounds maybe. There are heavier pilots flying it, but it becomes not the perfect choice anymore when you're over 230. You need to fly a really big wing and get lots of lift and, uh, yeah, th th I think the, the ideal pilot for a Nitro 200 weighs less than 230 pounds. You can fly to 260, guys do, but yeah, we're talking about ideals here. So let me get some more altitude, I'm almost out. Back up again. So, heading up the weight classes. The next up is the Moster 185 Plus. That, that's the next motor that I would consider buying. Actually, what I'm flying right now. Um, the Moster 185 Plus compared to the Nitro 200 is a little more powerful and it's a little smoother. I'm not sure one is more reliable than the other. Owners of the 185 Plus think they have the best motor in the world. Owners of the Nitro 200 think they have the best motor in the world. I've had both and I've been really happy. The 185 Plus is so new, but it, it flies great. We'll see how it deals 200 hours. The 185 Plus is a little heavier, so it's a better fit for like men. You know, if you get what I'm saying, I, obviously Ronda Rousey could, could carry it around and everything would be fine. But when you get into the Moster 185 Plus, the, the, the entire paramotor package tends to start at like 55 pounds and, and get to like 65 pounds as opposed to 45 pounds or 42 pounds on the Nitro side. And that makes a little difference, you know? I, I say it a lot, but imagine landing being kind of like jumping off the second stair, you know, headed down in your house. You know, doing that with a 40 pound versus like a 60 pound backpack, it makes a difference. The 185 Plus, because of its weight, becomes a better fit for guys. I, I don't mean to be sexist. But on the other hand, it handles big guys a little better. You know, if you're weighing 230, 250, 260, then um, that, that's, probably a good motor for you. It would be a nice choice and you'd be happy with it because even at 250, when you get to your second wing and you want to downsize a little bit, uh, it'll be there for you. So, so that's my take on the Moster 185. Now there is a new motor coming out that promises to be the best of both worlds. I have it on pre-order. I'll probably have it a month from now and it's the Tornado. The Tornado is both light and powerful, a combination that, that, that is hard to achieve. And uh, it would fit pilots of just about any size. Gosh, I, I think you could be 350 or, you know, if you're a tandem pilot, you could be 500 pounds, like super heavy guys. Tornado's super light, super powerful, and super smooth. It checks every box. The only reservation I have about the Tornado is that it's new. Now it hasn't stopped me, I'm buying one. But I will say that historically, if you buy a brand new motor, you're kind of rolling the dice on reliability. And I say this in you know 2018. If you're watching this in 2019 or 20, then, then the word will be out. You know, if it's gonna be your only paramotor and you're buying the first one off the assembly line, just know that you're kind of rolling the dice. I did that uh, with my first paramotor. It was a Polini 190, a Thor 190 Lite, and uh, it wasn't reliable for me. Um, so hopefully the tornado breaks that mold. I know that the, the boys have been testing it for at least a year now, maybe more, and they 
you know, hopefully found every bug before the customers do. But it's just a thing to be aware of that, you know, new pair of motors sometimes have those uh, quirks, those teething issues out of the gate. Won't stop me, but I thought I should mention it. And uh, the Tornado, shucks, it's so light that, like, I would say it's a good pair of motor for anybody, but it's so powerful. I think you want to either be an expert pilot or weigh at least, you know, 165, something like that. Uh, if I weighed if I weighed 165 on the dot, I'd get a Nitro 200, uh, just because it, it doesn't have scary power that you have to learn with. Uh, you could you could advance into the tornado if you're a light guy, or start with it if you're a heavy guy. Anyway, that's motors. Uh, I do want to say one more thing. You know what? I'll get altitude and say one more thing. You guys want to see me fly through this baby cloud? Sir. There's one right here. <laughs> That's what little clouds are like. So we've talked about getting instruction and buying motors. Uh, in terms of wings, man, there are a bunch of beginner and beginner immediate wings, but whether you pick like a straight up very starter wing or like a beginner immediate wing, it has a lot to do with how well you're picking up the sport. I will say this, don't feel bad about coming out of training and getting something like a Muse or a Mojo or, or, or you know a wing that you would first start with. Uh, Air Design has one called like the Lift or Lift Easy. Those are great wings and even when you get your second and third wing, not every day needs to be an acrobatic throwdown session. You might find after you're flying that work and family take some of the best flying days and you're in trashy air. That's the kind of day that you might break out the big safe beginner wing and have a good safe time instead of taking your, you know, free ride for example or snake or carve or whatever out on days where it's hard to fly you know that's that might not be the flight you're looking for so it's nice to have a beginner wing in the quiver i do and and i still pull it out and i still enjoy it so uh, don't don't go thinking you're going to outgrow this wing. Uh, if there's one downside to beginner wings, it's that they're slower. And this sport is just as much fun slow as it is fast, but if you fly with other people and you can't keep up with them, that can feel yucky. Or if winds aloft are 15 miles an hour and your wing only goes like 18 or 20 with you on it, then five minutes in one direction can take like 45 minutes or an hour to get back as you head into the wind. So uh, that's a case where a wing that goes 30 or 35 miles an hour becomes really nice, you know, so, so that's the thing. But don't feel bad about a beginner wing. You'll want that wing even when you're not a beginner. Uh, the boys at Aviator PPG have every wing available to them and they still throw their mojo parties all the time and have a blast on beginner wings. Uh, I do that myself, I'm just all alone. <laughs> so anyway, that's a word about wings. Training. Uh, I know I talked about this already. It is nice if the school has equipment. Some schools do, some schools don't. But like having gone through the experience that I went through learning, I might not have bought my Fresh Breeze that I started with if that wasn't like the first step in my training, right? On my training, day one, I wrote a check for like $12,000 or something for all my equipment and training and uh, that, that was like how it started. And then after I flew it, you know, I, I didn't keep that motor very long. It, it wasn't reliable for me and it was so heavy that it was difficult to work with. If the school lets you learn on their equipment, one, you know what you're getting into, and two, I feel like that says, you know, something about the school's uh, confidence in their gear. That, you know, they want you to try it before you buy it. That, so I, I like schools that do that. There are good schools that don't do that, but uh, I do like it when they do. Oh, you know what I want you to know about weather? I, I, I think sometimes people get into this, I know I did, not realizing that 
especially beginner pilots, the times you want to fly are morning and night. I, I should say sunrise and sunset. I had this idea that on any given day at 3 p.m. I would just run into the sky. And the truth is, I do fly at 3 p.m. or noon or whatever, but I'm a more experienced pilot now. It didn't start that way. When I first started, I only flew with other people. I wanted to have mentors around me, and that meant that it was mostly weekends, and uh, I only flew sunrises and sunsets, and it, you know, it just really limits the, the window that you can fly. And I, I just felt like as a new pilot, it, it, I would have done it anyway. Gosh, I mean, who doesn't want this superpower? But it was something that I didn't know going into it. You know, I was driving around at 1 p.m. looking at the clouds thinking I should do that when, uh, you know, I, uh, I didn't realize it. It was going to be two years before 1 p.m. was a suitable time for me to fly. And some people never fly midday. They, they, they just, it's not their cup of tea. It's not the flight they're looking for. So let me get some altitude. All right. Next, I want to talk about who can be a paramotor pilot. Um, a lot of people get inspired to fly paramotors by Tucker Gott. I know Tucker. I love Tucker. He's great. But I will say, um, Tucker's aviation credentials are so impeccable that it can be off-putting almost. Uh, it, Tucker has been around aircraft since he was a kid, all kinds of aircraft. His mom is a commercial hot air balloon pilot. He grew up by an airport as a child. His hobbies included buying electronics and making drones. He was flying fixed wing aircraft at 16 years old. He got a job at a skydiving facility to buy his first paramotor. This is a guy who is half bird. Um, but you don't have to be Tucker to fly paramotors. Uh, I am not half bird. I was always half fish. I grew up swimming and surfing and jet skiing and, and you know, the, the sky was never my thing. But somewhere at like 43, 42 years old, I just decided that, you know what? Like, I want to run into the sky. And, uh, I won't be denied. So I mentioned it to my wife and she said no, <laughs> as, as she does. But, um, you know, I'd never do cool stuff if I stopped at the first no. So, I, you know, I, I talked about it a little longer and a little longer. And eventually I showed her videos on YouTube of this kid. He was in a James Aldred video. I think he was like seven years old and flying a paramotor. And I'm like, honey, gosh, if this kid can do it, then I can do it. And, uh, that's, I think that was what, what was the tipping point. We got on the same page. Now I do it all the time. Uh, but uh, you don't have to be rich. I know, I, I said, I think 10 to 13 or 10 to $14,000. Uh, that's, that's not nothing. But I don't feel like people look at motorcycles and say, oh my goodness, motorcycles are so expensive. I could never achieve that dream, right? But something about aviation, you know, it scares you. It makes you think that it's going to be incredibly expensive. And, you know, it's not free. I don't pretend it is. The flights practically are. This flight is going to cost me like $5 less than lunch, just in fuel. But uh, you don't have to have a solid aviation pedigree to do what I'm doing right now, which is just find a piece of grass, run into the sky, and be amongst the clouds. Like, this is a thing that you can actually accomplish. A lot of people can, you know? If you could go motorcycling, then you could probably go paramotoring and have this. I, I have a friend that I fly with, he's much smarter than me, and he's like, I don't understand why this isn't more popular. And just something about it coming from him, it was like, yeah. I don't get it either. I, I would think that everybody would would wish they were here with me right now. This is insane. This is this is outrageous. So uh, so yeah. Um, in terms of how fit you have to be, I would say to foot launch like I do to run into the sky, then you need to be fit enough to put like. I'll say 60 pounds on your back and run 100 yards. Uh, that's not a typical launch, but you know, to go through the training and stuff like that, can you jog with 60 pounds on your back across a football field? If you can do that, then you're probably fit enough to learn to fly a paramotor. 
Uh, if you fly a quad or a trike, you know, they have uh, like wheeled versions of this, then I would say in terms of fitness, you know, you just need to be under maybe 350 pounds. And, and, and there are pilots who've been heavier than that, but it's usually a bit of a struggle and, and probably one of these little two-stroke engines is not the right fit for you. Uh, I, I think I saw a guy who was 450 or maybe more fly it, but he was full throttle the entire time and his motor wouldn't last that long. And you know, He should be in a powered parachute or a fixed wing aircraft or, or something more appropriate for a big guy. So yeah, if you could run with 60 pounds on your back or jog with 60 pounds on your back across a football field, you could foot launch a paramotor. There it is. Uh, if, if you're a bigger guy, then you could probably launch a trike or a quad. Uh, there are old pilots, you know, pilots close to 70. Um, young pilots, let's talk about that. Um, there are young pilots, guys out there who are 7, guys who are 12. Uh, my personal, like, parenting philosophy on young pilots is, uh, like, would you trust them to drive a car, right? I think that's a good proxy for flying a paramotor. When you drive a car, you have to make good, quick decisions. And they become life or death decisions. That's, that's the, the name of the game. And when you drive a paramotor, the same thing can happen. So I'm not saying you have to have a driver's license. You don't. There are no licensing requirements for these paramotors. Some people even self-train. But you're a, you know, I, I know that when my kids were 12, they were still goofy enough that I didn't want them on paramotors. But your mileage may vary. If you would trust your kid to drive, then yeah, that's a good proxy for whether or not they're ready to fly a paramotor. So that, that's my take on kids flying and, and what kind of conditioning it takes. So the cloud cover is just growing. I think I'm gonna put it down. Uh, I would be able to legally fly under these clouds, but it's smart to have a place to land at all times. You know, you always want to be able to glide to your landing zone. And these clouds are low enough that it's just a little risky. It's not the flight I'm looking for. So, uh, so I'm going to put her down, call it a flight. It's been good. All right, safe and sound. Uh, good flight. I, just, I was walking back, there's like hummingbirds at the flowers, the sun is out. What a great way to start my day. I'm gonna, gonna have an omelet and things will be good. If you have a question I didn't answer in the video, then put it in the comments and I'll try to stay active on it. It's 11 a.m., I had breakfast, everything was great, but I keep looking at these clouds. I could be up there. I will be up there. So, just gonna grab my floaty wing and give it a go. It should be cool. I. We've got rain coming. It's gonna be yucky for two days or so. I'm gonna take advantage of what I have. All right. So I am at about 6,000 feet, 6,047 to be precise. And the clouds are at about 3,000. I saw them down low like that, and just, I just couldn't resist. But I thought this would give me a good opportunity, since I'll bundle this with the, uh, you know, getting started in paramotors video, to talk about horsepower and, and what it means. I, I heard a new way to think about it from, I, I heard a new way to think about it just recently. And uh, he was telling me this, he's like, imagine my cruising horsepower like on a given wing requires like 14 horsepower, right? So it requires 14 horsepower to cruise and go straight and level, okay? If your motor has 20 horsepower, then six of those are devoted to climbing. If your motor has 26 horsepower, to make the math easy, then 12 of them are devoted to climbing. That's, so even though, you know, the motor's only gone from 20 to 26, your climb power has doubled because it's twice as far from the baseline of 14. I hope that made sense to you guys. Now you can't have too much power, you know, you can overcome that with expertise. I, I'm really thinking of the tornado in particular. I know a pilot 
who's uh, he's he's light. He's tall, but he's thin. And he flew the tornado, and it kind of uh, it, it stalled on him. It went parachutal. And and this is a, a good pilot. He won the Icarus X this year as a race, and just experienced pilot. And uh, he took a stall on the tornado because it had so much power that you know his whole body like swung like this, and the wing wasn't straight and level and he just went too far and he stalled that can happen in an extreme case like a light pilot and a tornado now the lightest pilot i know i'll say kyle moody flies a tornado i bet he weighs 135 140 but he's an advanced expert level pilot he's a professional instructor and he's prepared for this sort of thing all i'm saying is that more power is nice but too much power is not nice at all and and i, I just thought i'd share that idea because i hadn't really thought of it in terms of gap over the baseline until recently i have another friend i don't know what he weighs call it 165 170 and he flew a top 80 so that was not enough motor for him his launches took forever he'd run like a city block to, to take off and i feel like to describe him, you know, he needed, I'll make it up, 15 horsepower to fly straight and level, and he had 17 horsepower total, so he could barely climb. That's the, the problem you get into when you have uh, not enough power. On the other hand, he's become very good at launching a paramotor, and I think all of those runs really honed his skills. Whereas if you get a lot of power, it makes launching easy, and uh, you don't necessarily, you're not forced to develop the skills that a guy with an underpower motor does. But anyway, that's horsepower and, uh, and the difference that it makes. Too much is dangerous, but having extra makes launching and climbing easy. Another anticipated topic, wings. I know I talked a little bit about this already, but I heard um, Tucker Gott say, you know, all wings are pretty good, so long as you buy from one of the major manufacturers. But then he didn't list them. So it took me time to figure out, like, who the players were. Uh, obviously, there's Dudek, there's Ozone, there's Niviek, there's... Um, U-turn is getting into paramotors. That's what I flew this morning. Um, big uh, back pair. I don't know how I could leave them out. Uh, it, it, there's a lot of name brand wings out there, and they're all so good. Um, the, the, a instructor, advanced level guy, recently told me all wings are awesome, all motors are yucky. And man, like it, every time that pops into my head, the wisdom of it seems better and better. Yeah, I have flown, I'd have to look at it, I think I've flown 17 different wings, and I liked every wing but one. You know, it, it, wings are perfect for a given mission. Uh, this wing right here, it does big swoopy turns, but really what's magic about it is its lift. I feel like I can sit here with barely losing any altitude all day and that is its magic trick its lift i bought it for free flight where lift is hard to come by but i sometimes take it up on the paramotor because i want to go right to six thousand feet or you know i just want a peaceful ride or something like that um, i have another wing the u-turn progress that's the most aggressive wing i own and when i want to get upside down that wing makes it easy so th it's good at that and it also has a a large component of safety built into it so that's uh that's the reason i chose that wing the progress because it gets aggressive and it's meant to sort of save you uh, as you get to the higher level wings this is the the, the what am I saying? The Gin Carb. Gin's another good wing manufacturer. The Gin Carb, the Ozone Free Ride, the Ozone Viper, the Dudex Snake, or Hadron XX. Um, that level of wing, those question mark sort of slalom wings, are trying to kill you the whole time. It's the whole time you fly them, you are putting in inputs that keep those wings above you and keep you safe. There are other wings, for example, the wings that you would start with, like the Mac Para Charger, the um, the Ramaflex comes to mind, the the Ozone Mojo or Spider. Those wings are trying to keep you alive the whole time. You do dumb things, and they want nothing more than to like center you, put you under the wing, and have you go recover to being sort of straight and level and okay again. Uh, that's not the case with some of these advanced wings. You know, when you fly, if, even if you do nothing, you just start swinging, and you have to bring them back under control if you're looking for that kind of flight then they can be a great time but that's the difference between the advanced wings and the uh, starter wings i don't want to say starter i want to say the protective wings you know because 
an advanced pilot will have a great time on a protective wing, but that's the gap. Anyway, all wings are great, just depending on the mission you're going for. Uh, you might, in a cross-country wing, want something that's really fast and stable. That's what I look for, because it can be bumpy up there. The landings can be rough. I don't want something that's not handling problems for me in a cross-country wing. In an acro wing, you know, it, it, I, I want something that gets jiggy with it, that goes big. In a, in a starter wing or a gentle ride wing, I want something that, that protects me all the time. So all wings are great. It's the motor that is going to be the pain. And that includes every motor out there, even the top brands. Uh, the motor is going to be the thing that doesn't start someday, that doesn't have the thrust, that needs its rubber pair. I had an instructor, oh man, this sunk in so deep. He's a Marine, right? Big, strong guy, bushy beard. Nice guy, but just like to look at him, you'd say, yeah, that guy can probably beat me up. He's like all Marine are riflemen, right? Every Marine is a rifleman. It doesn't matter if you're artillery or a tank guy or a helicopter pilot or a cook. Every Marine is a rifleman. And on that same note, every paramotor pilot is a mechanic. You know, some guys will specialize it, some won't. But every paramotor pilot eventually gets some level of mechanic skills. And that's just the, the nature of this thing, man. Which is why, when you fly, you always have a place to land. Uh, that's my yard right there. That's probably what I choose. Every Marine's a rifleman. Every paramotor pilot is a mechanic, at least to some extent. Uh, the, if you don't know anything about motors now and they seem complicated to you, they won't after a while. Uh, you'll learn your way around these simple engines and it won't be a problem at all. Anyway, I'm going to get some more altitude. I thought of another beginner topic to talk about. Safety. And, and, and specifically, how dangerous are paramotors? And uh, so it goes like this. Statistically, it's safer than a motorcycle overall, right? Or so I've read. It's not as safe as a car. It falls somewhere in that range. Now, motorcycles are dangerous too. How dangerous a paramotor is has a lot to do with you as the pilot. If you treat paramotoring kind of like I sometimes do as a sport, right? If your goal is to get upside down and, and learn new moves and practice your and practice your stalls and, and all sorts of cool stuff, that's cool to me, then it adds to the danger factor. If you do that stuff low to the ground to impress other people, it dramatically adds to the danger factor. Um, I, I know two pilots that died this year, and I don't know what killed them, but I do know that there's a lot of... Uh, people talk about how they did low acro, and they found their flying style dangerous. Uh, one of the guys, just this rumor, I don't know if it's true, uh, I heard that he was chasing away coyotes, like a farmer asked him for help. So he was, you know, moving around, doing lots of low to the ground proximity stuff, and uh, it bit him, maybe. Or, or that's not true rumor. But it is true that he died. And it is true that he was known for a flying style of uh, getting jiggy with it down low. People don't usually get hurt by doing wingovers at 6,000 feet. But the record for the lowest acro has been tied by a lot of dead pilots. If you treat paramotoring like aviation, uh, flights like I'm doing today, except maybe not midday, if you treat it like aviation, where, you know, your goal is to go nice and steady, you like going straight, you like traveling places, you just enjoy sitting in the sky, and this lawn chair at five, six, ten thousand 10,000 feet is your idea of a good time, then it's very safe. Uh, people don't get hurt very much. As a matter of fact, I, I could just take a nap right here, coast all the way to the ground with my engine off, and not be very hurt. You know, I'm not going to hit the ground going that fast. I'm not, I'd probably just land in a tree around here and get suspended. What I'm saying is, it, it, it's as safe as you make it. And uh, especially as a new pilot, it's a real smart idea to just take it easy. Uh, we're all inspired by Tucker and, and the moves that he does, but Tucker's not just starting. You know, like I said earlier in the video, he has an aviation pedigree that, that I don't, and you probably don't too. So uh, yeah, paramotoring can be very safe. 
uh, if you fly in good weather and you don't do aggressive things close to the ground, then you're going to be okay, probably. <laughs> um, some of the most dangerous things about paramotoring uh, happen on s launching, really. Uh, the, the most common way to get seriously hurt is uh, to hit a spinning prop. Usually that happens when someone's on the ground, like pulling their paramotor, and it comes at them. Uh, the most common way to die in flight is to drown, right? That you probably would have thought it was from, you know, that wing turning into a streamer and just dropping straight down, but that's that's not really the problem. Newer wings are safer and safer. Uh, the most common way to die in a flying accident is to drown. So uh, that obviously can be prevented with good behavior or good protective equipment. They make uh, inflating things that, that bump out to the side. Or if you're doing a day where you know you're over water all day, some people wear a life preserver to keep themselves extra safe. But paramotoring doesn't have to be dangerous. Uh, but you can choose to make it dangerous, and, and that's up to you. If you don't fly over your head, then um, it's going to be a whole lot safer for you. Goodness! I left out some of the easiest and most common questions. How high does it go? How fast does it go? How long does it go? You know, how far does it go? Stuff like that. So how high does it go? Uh, the legal limit is 18,000 feet. Uh, the highest I know of that didn't take like special uh, precautions like, you know, oxygen masks for themselves and oxygen for their motor and special tuning and stuff and um, is Tucker God who went 15,000 feet. That's the highest flight I know of. My personal highest is 10,000. I actually did it just a week ago. Um, so, so yeah, that's how high they go. About 15,000, and you'll probably run out of power and, and have trouble. And then it's also dangerous for you. The oxygen is so thin up there that uh, unless you really fit or maybe from a high oxygen or low oxygen environment or something, uh, flying at 15,000 feet for me might be a little sketch, you know, because... As much as I try to ignore it, I am 45, and I'm no cross-country athlete, so me going to 15,000 might be sketch. Uh, how fast do they go? So I cruise around most of the time at 25 or 30. I think the fastest I could go if I wanted to is probably 40, maybe 42, something like that. If I took my progress which is my smallest, fastest wing, and went full trims and full speed bar. I bet I could go about 40. Um, Mark Honeycutt went 109, but he did that. He did that at actually on, on a wing I was landing in. That wing goes about 30 miles an hour, which tells me that he had about an 80 mile an hour tailwind. That's, that's about what that was. He went to 10,000 feet. He planned it out. This is a thing that Mark enjoys doing. Like when he sees wind gradients and at 10,000 feet, there's a 70, 80 mile an hour tailwind. Mark is all over that stuff. It's his idea of a good time. So that's what he did. Uh, and he, he got, as far as I know, I don't know anyone that went faster than 109 miles an hour on a, on a paramotor. But that's ground speed. His airspeed was probably about 30. The fastest wings... Ah, Maybe threaten 50? I think 50 or 55 is the fastest they're allowed to go, except for like temporary situations like a dive. Any faster than that, and um, you, you're, you're violating FAA regulations. But yeah, so 50, 55 is maybe as quick as a wing can go. 40 is as quick as I can go. And I usually go about 25. I don't think in this sport going 40 is much more fun than 30 or 20. The, the only difference is uh, if there's a headwind, it's nice to be able to cover ground sometimes. How long do they fly? So a paramotor is allowed to carry five gallons by law, and it burns a little more than a gallon per hour. So with five gallons, I could probably fly for four hours. Right there, there it is. Most paramotors I know of carry just over three. Now the problem with five gallons is it becomes very heavy to launch with, and the size of the fuel tank blocks airflow to the propeller. So you, you get kind of a double whammy there. The prop is a little less efficient and the, um, and it's harder to launch with all that weight. But with three gallons, uh, my, my Nitro I know flies about two hours, 15 minutes, two hours, 20 minutes. I pushed it a couple of times. Uh, this one, I don't know, maybe a little longer, but not much, you know, not more than two and a half hours, I wouldn't think. And how far you can go in that time? Well, you know, if there's no uh, 
um, headwind, if the air is still, I, I guess I could go about 50 or 60 miles. 60. More than 60 and you're uh, kind of taking your chances. So there it is. 10, 50,000 feet is your height. 25, 30 is a normal speed. 50 is an extreme one. And two, two and a half hours is probably about how far you can fly unless you do something special to hold extra gas and then it stretches to four. That's what they do. They're not really practical. I think some people dream of flying to work. Um, you want to be so choosy about your weather, especially when you're new, that, uh, you know, that, that would be a, a, a special situation, a day you actually flew to work. And also, you probably work in a more congested area. You don't want to be flying over a bunch of houses or spots where you can't land safely or fly legally. So they're not practical. They're fun. That, that's what this is about. Uh, a motorcycle is more practical than a paramotor. And I can tell you as a motorcycle guy, they're not that practical either. Another fun question. What happens if the engine dies? Well, by and large, you're fine. Every landing, I kill my engine at probably 50 feet in the air, sometimes 100, sometimes 2,000. Uh, my engine is idling right now, it's doing nothing. So I would ju it'd be just like this, and I would steer to wherever I wanted to land and land there. When you fly, a responsible pilot always has a landing zone in mind the whole time and that's no joke you, know, these, these, you will get a motor out at some point in your career so find always fly with the spot where it's okay to land uh, if you don't have a spot to land you'll probably coast into some vegetation right that, that'll probably be your reality uh, it'll be a pain in the butt to extract your motor and wing uh, you might get some damage to one or the other or both but you'll probably be okay. Most people who land in trees don't get hurt. Um, it's much more common to get hurt climbing out of the tree on your own because you didn't wait for help than it is to get hurt landing in the tree. Uh, when you land in the tree, your wing tends to catch enough branches and you just sort of stuck there. But what happens if the motor goes out? Not a lot. Uh, it's, it'd be just like this and I would cruise to some place I thought was safe to land. I probably have 30, 40 good options uh, at this altitude with my glide ratio. So what happens if the motor goes out? Nothing if you prepare for it. If you prepare for it, you'll be all right. If you watched all my videos, and no one's watched all of them, but uh, you've seen me handle some motor routes before. Sometimes artfully, and so <laughs> one time in the Icarus X, uh, not so artfully, but not so bad. Nothing broke. All right, so I'm gonna bring her in for a landing. Uh, I guess I can do a set. I've never done a set on the Scout, so it's kind of attention grabbing for me. But I've done lots of them on my uh, Nitro 200. So. Let's see how this goes. Uh, I think I want a double wrap. I'm gonna try uh, a wrap and a half, maybe something. Let's try this. Nice! This is going well. Alright, somewhere along that way my motor died. <laughs> I don't know if I pressed the kill button, which is the most likely answer. But uh, now I have to start her up again in flight after idling for a bit. So wish me luck on this one. Ah, oh, shitty pull. Oh. That wasn't so bad. I of course could have just landed it with the motor off, but <clears throat> I prefer motor on. I'm used to it. Man! On my Nitro, I carry gloves just for taking wraps. That's what it does to my hand when I wrap it and pull that hard. But it'll heal. I still have a lot of altitude to burn. And I'm here over the trees. 
happy as could be. I think I'm gonna do some wing overs and uh, go through some of this altitude. Let's get this party started. Shift, bro. There you go. Good times. A little late. Ah, pulled it off. And let's kill the energy. Spiraled out because I think I was going to be late if I did a reversal on that last one, which. Implies I did it imperfectly, but uh, better safe than sorry. Still have altitude. Man, that's this wing's magic trick, I'm telling you. Like, uh, I, I was thinking earlier in this video, I talked about how I like every wing I flew. You know, this one is particularly good at gaining altitude and not losing altitude. Like, it's super, super lifty. It's not the safest wing I own, that would be the Muse 3. Uh, it's not the fastest wing I own, that'd probably be the Progress or the Speedster before I, I wore it out. Um, it's, it's a great wing for preserving and gaining altitude. Uh, I enjoy it for that. So the worst part about flying midday, according to me, is the landing. Um, it's just like it's getting hot, I'm getting bounced around, I'm almost a little bit airsick. Uh, the thermals lift you and set you down, so like if you really want to plan your glide, uh, that, that could be a little bit tricky. And uh, I don't know, sometimes the, the way I get bumped around, it impacts the pilot more than the aircraft. Like, you know, it just sort of knocks me off my game and uh, puts me in the yellow a little bit. So I have to take a breath and be like, hey, you know how to do this. Everything is cool. You know, get into your mantra and, and like just execute what you know how to execute on. That's that's all there is to it. So, uh, so that's what I'm about to try and do. I'm trying to come in over these trees past the power line. Going to head right up this stripe. A little too high. So I'm doing my S turns. A big turn, Woody! See, now I'm getting lift that I don't want. Anticipate the sink. Chin up. And nail it like a butterfly with sore feet. All right, <clears throat> so uh, yeah, that's what it looks like when everything goes right. 